Pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah, as Anna said, um, my name's Jo, a clinical psychologist here at St George's Hospital in Tooting. Um, so we work with um, patients, families, loved ones, all affected by cancer um, here within the Trust. Um, so it's lovely that you've um, all joined today. Um, so as Anna's, Anna's said, you know, um, this is sort of my, my day to day uh, and I hope that these are some helpful ideas um, to help you think about what to perhaps expect as treatments kind of coming to an end and uh, some, some ideas of how to cope and, and move forward. Um, if there are any questions that I can't answer on the spot today, um, I will do my best, but um, I'm more than happy to go away and do some research um, and I can come back to Anna, Laura and Alice and the team um, and they're happy to email those bits to you. <clears throat> so we'll um, see how we go. All right, so I'm gonna do my techie bit now, try and share my uh, slides with you. There we go. Super. All right. Um, so I'm yeah going to be thinking a little bit about some of the fears, some of the anxieties that you may be noticing, experiencing as you're coming to the end of treatment and, and moving into a new phase. So I guess people often say to us, well, I don't know, how, how am I supposed to feel? What am I meant to feel at, at the end of treatment? And that's a really good question. Sometimes there's an expectation that we're supposed to feel delighted and elated and it's fantastic and we might do um, and that's great and that's fine but we might also have a whole mix of other feelings that we experience at this point in time. It can be a real roller coaster. We can feel relieved, we feel pleased, hopeful but we can also feel apprehensive, we can feel fearful, we can feel worried um, a whole host of different emotions. We might feel a bit irritable, we might feel a bit sad. We know that actually when you start to see your team less often, not only is that anxiety provoking, but that might be something that you miss, that you, you know, get some benefit from seeing people regularly and getting that support. So there's where some of those sort of concerns or, or uh, nervous feelings might come from. So there isn't any one feeling you're supposed to feel at this point in time and we know that our feelings change from moment to moment, day to day and week to week. So there's no set experience you should be having right now. So anything, anything even from uh, this list here or more is really normal, is really natural. So often people come to us um, and are experiencing that degree of anxiety, that degree of, of sadness once treatment's coming to an end. And actually that can be even more confusing if for some of you, you're on ongoing maintenance treatment, because it's really hard to kind of make sense of what that means. Is that the end of treatment? When does the end of treatment come? And what does that mean for me? So that can add another layer on top that can cause, cause all sorts of different feelings. So as I mentioned, it's often the expectation that we're going to feel elated, we might do, but actually it's very common and it's very normal to experience that whole set of potentially unexpected feelings, the things that we don't necessarily anticipate um, coming at that point. We often feel like life is going to get back to normal and it'll all feel good again, but actually we know that that can be a really difficult time, that transition between sort of treatment coming to a close and, and moving forward again. So what are some of the common worries? Well, it's understandable, the questions such as what happens now? What's happening next in my treatment and in my care? Um, lots of thoughts about what that's going to look like and, and how that's going to be for you. Often people have a whole host of questions about how life is going to be, whether that's going to be returning to how life was before cancer. Um, we know in the context of COVID that life is very different anyway at the moment. So there's all sorts of other challenges that I think we're facing at the moment in terms of what's normal and when we're going to be able to get back to things. But definitely at the end of treatment, it is that sort of thinking about that adjustment and what that's going to be like. There's also some thoughts about, well, what are other people going to expect of me? So often people will say to us, well, everyone congratulates me that I've 
come to the end of some treatment and they expect that life does return to normal and that I'm fine and that everything's okay. So there's often those worries about people assuming that you're back to your normal, usual self, whatever that might mean. And actually, I think it's really important to acknowledge that there will be lots of loved ones in your lives that will also share these common worries. You know, they might be thinking, what does, what's my wife, partner, daughter, sister, mum, and so on? How are they going to be? And they will have their own worries about you and, and what life will be like going forward. And absolutely understandably and tremendously common is the worry about whether cancer will come back. So there's all sorts of thoughts that will be associated with that, if that happens, when that happens, and, and how I might cope with that. Um, and actually it's much more unusual and uncommon not to have those thoughts than it is to have them. So thinking about some of the triggers, um, well, we know that nearly everyone, as I said, who's been through cancer, who's been through cancer treatment, does have these fears about um, cancer returning. And we know there's all sorts of points that we're going to experience more of those feelings. Um, we know, as I mentioned earlier, that you guys may be having less contact with your team. Your appointments might be uh, more spread out or less frequent. Um, and that we know actually when there are follow-ups or when there are scans, those can be times where we start to feel more anxious, more worried. That our mind is naturally chewing over all those possibilities um, of what might be the outcome of those appointments and meetings. Um, and we've termed this coin, or lots of people have termed this um, term scansiety. So we know that scans just are a really big part of um, the anxiety we experience. And it's really normal and natural in the weeks, days coming up to that scan, as I said, for your mind to be focused on that, for your mind to be wandering and thinking about the outcome. Um, you will feel ner nervous. It will be difficult, but we'll think about some ways to manage that um, shortly. We also know that we get exposed to all sorts of different messages and stories about cancer. You know, there's often adverts on television um, there's things that we come across in social media or in the papers. Um, and those can be reminders about cancer and they can be reminders about our experience. So that can often kind of increase some of those worries and fears that you, you might have. We also know that you're adjusting to your body and making sense of physical sensations, physical symptoms, and you're trying to relearn what all of that means for you. Potentially pre-cancer, you might not have paid as much attention to some twinges, some niggles, some sensations in the body, but now these might be much more anxiety provoking for you because you've been really used to a lot of physical treatment, a lot of symptoms, um, both from cancer and from the treatment itself. So it's understandable that um, experiencing those physical symptoms will trigger some of that anxiety. Hearing about other people's experiences as well. Um, so we know that when we hear about others that we've got to know um, who have gone through a recurrence or require more treatment, um, we can feel anxious. And also some of those anniversaries. So perhaps thinking, you know, back to the time when you were first diagnosed or other significant markers for you um, may again, you know, those, those anxieties might resurface again. So I think it's useful to just be aware that these sorts of things might trigger that anxiety, um, to be reassured that that's very common. Um, and it's really useful for you to just be prepared to know that those are the things that might um, trigger off those difficulties for you. And then we can start to think about what you might do to manage those. So we know that worry is normal. Um, and we all know that there will be a realistic possibility of some recurrence. So we can't eliminate worry altogether. We can't eliminate these thoughts that there may be some cancer recurrence in the future. So the best that we can do is be gentle and kind with ourselves um, and find some ways that we can live alongside those worries um, sort of making a bit of space for them um, and actually if we're able to do that that enables us to then focus on what we do want to do what what's important to us right now 
Um, so the bulk of my talk is going to be thinking about that, is how we can make, make space for some of those fears and anxieties um, and how we can still help you move forward and engage in a meaningful life for you. Um, but before I do that, I do want to think a little bit about keeping an eye on some of these particular um, fears and anxieties. If you're experiencing a lot of these, and if you're getting very stuck, that might be an indicator that you might need a little bit of extra help. Or if the strategies from today's webinar aren't quite helping you overcome those, yeah, that might be a sign that it's, it would be helpful to talk with someone. And again, we can think about that as we go along. So it'd be really useful to kind of keep an eye out for whether there are some of these uh, thoughts and images that are, are popping up and, and coming out quite often for you. Um, so we can get stuck in particular patterns of thinking. Um, and again, these are some of the common ones that show up for people. Um, so this sense of focusing on the worst case. So we might have thoughts like it will come back and I won't be able to cope. So it's really zoning in on all worst aspects of what the future might have to hold. There's focusing on the negatives. Um, so we might think things to ourselves like I'll never be able to do the things knowing it might come back. Uh, and if it does come back, there's no hope. So there's sort of zoning in on all those negative aspects. There might be overestimating your control. Again, this is a really common one. So um, I need to do everything I can to prevent this from happening again. So we can kind of go into overdrive, trying to control a lot of things to avoid um, any possibility of that recurrence. Um, and if I'm not constantly keeping an eye out, then something will get missed. We can also get in the habit of jumping to conclusions. So when I was mentioning earlier, we're kind of tuning back into our bodies and what sensations mean. Sometimes we can get in the habit of kind of assuming the worst case scenario, assuming that a physical symptom must be a sign that the cancer is coming back and that we can jump to that conclusion quite quickly. Might also be overestimating risk. Um, so we might say to ourselves, I just know that I'm going to be one of the unlucky ones, despite what my team are telling me, despite what I know. And we actually also know that we can get into patterns of either avoiding our thoughts, so trying really, really hard to not think about any of our worries, to not think about the future, to not think about any possible um, problems that we might come across. Or we can go the other way and we can actually spend a lot of time chewing over our thoughts, going over them over and over again, trying to find a way to sort the thoughts out or solve the problem or make, make our fears better. And actually often um, either of those ways of thinking get us more stuck and actually don't tend to resolve anything for us. So it's really worth sort of checking out um, whether there are any of these particular styles that you notice that you can get caught up in. Um, and it's fine to think some of these things and there are some strategies that we're going to talk about to either find a more balanced way of thinking or to let go of some of those thoughts or, or hold those thoughts more lightly. But if you notice, despite any of the things we're suggesting that these keep coming up and you keep getting stuck, um, then again, that might be a time to get that extra bit of help. Um, so when we have these sorts of thoughts, we feel much more anxious. And then we engage in lots of things to try and deal with the anxiety and the fears that we're experiencing. So we might notice that we start checking or scanning our bodies for lots of signs and symptoms and that we might do that above and beyond the advice that we've been given. So we can spend an awful lot of time focused in on our bodies. We might find the more anxious we get and the more fearful we are, we kind of stick to our comfort zones. So we don't kind of test the waters that we don't. Uh, step back into trying to do things that we were doing before or things that we enjoy because we just feel too fearful. We try and keep ourselves as safe as possible. As I said earlier, we might avoid things. So certainly we might avoid our thinking, but we might also avoid anything to do with cancer. So we might switch off if there's any conversation about it or any reminder or anything that we come across um, that we might shut down to it and not want to know about it. We might go the other way. 
so we might go into overdrive in doing lots of research trying to find out lots and lots of information or going back over written information um, that we've had from your care team or any other information you've been given and i think it's about saying this is a balance it's okay to do a bit of research and it's certainly okay to go over your information but just noticing whether that anxiety is meaning that you're spending a huge amount of time doing these sorts of things and actually it's increasing your anxiety rather than reducing it. We can also end up looking for holes in advice um, if we're feeling anxious and we want to increase our certainty that everything's going to be okay. Um, because we want to problem solve, we want to find the problem and fix it, so we reduce our fear and anxiety. We might also re find uh, reassurance, look for reassurance in other people. Um, might, might be our care team, that might actually be from loved ones, that might be from other people um, we've come across and that we've met who've been through similar experiences. We might find that we avoid anything that might increase our risk of, of recurrence, so again, it's looking for sort of more extremes. So it's sensible and helpful to make healthy decisions in terms of your lifestyle, but it's just looking whether you're making that far too narrow and being very tight and restricted in what you're doing, how you're doing it. Because um, in the long run, we actually find that makes you more anxious and doesn't actually reduce your real risk um, particularly. And also maybe when we're feeling that fear and anxiety, we can get overactive, particularly if we're trying to ignore the worries, ignore the thoughts, um, avoid that difficulty, we can end up doing too much. And that can be quite exhausting, that can be quite overwhelming in itself. And it often means we miss out on doing other meaningful things that we want to be doing. And we know after treatment, you know, lots of people will experience fatigue and tiredness. So that can kind of compound that experience. So sort of hopefully relatively obvious <laughs> but that pattern where we start to think in those ways we experience anxiety and then we act in these ways that actually end up getting us more stuck and often fuel those thoughts fuel that anxiety um, and leave us in a bit of a pickle so this is just a bit of a diagram that i hope explains some of that a little bit more visually um, and have a moment to sort of read read through that um, but it goes through some of the triggers that um, I've mentioned that can lead to those thoughts, feelings, physical sensations and then our actions, our behaviours. And I guess I'll just sort of highlight here what, what you will notice is with those host of different uh, emotions from anxiety to fearness to irritability and anger we're going to feel some physical sensations and then if we're all Hi, participants. I'm ever so sorry. We seem to have um, just lost Joe for a moment. So we're just going to um, see what we can do to get Joe back. We did practice this because um, Joe's in tooting, so there's it's obviously a busy area with a lot of pressure on a broadband. And she's chosen and um, she swapped her, her Wi Fi, so we might need to do that again. So if you can just bear with us for a moment or two, we'll do everything we can to get Joe back. It, this might be a nice time to um, pop up and get yourself a drink for a minute or so while we, um, we get Joe back. So we'll let you know as soon as we're. we're up and running again. Sorry ever so much for that, but we'll um, we'll get started. So I'll probably just mute myself now and give Joe a call, and we'll see what we can do. Thank you. Okay, and it might be a good uh, chance to just have a think about any questions that are coming up from what Joe has said so far. Um, and do do send them to us in the chat and the Q and A box as well, um, and we'll read them out. I can see that we've got one already in the uh, in the Q and A box, which is great. Thank you for sending that in. 
and um, and anything else that comes up uh, do do send them to us and hopefully if we can get Jo back then um, we'll we'll be able to ask her those questions after she's finished speaking. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so I'll unmute myself and I'll hang up on the phone now and then I'll make you host so that we can see your video again, Joe. Thank you. Bye. So let us make Joe host for a moment. I think this is looking good, everybody. I think we can get back. And then we should get Joe should be able to start a video. Fab. And if you want to make me the host again, Joe. And we can pick up where we left off. Apologise to everybody. The joys of uh, NHS Wi-Fi. Uh, there we go. Are we back on? Lovely. It's as if nothing happened. <laughs> I do apologise. <laughs> We're linked to my phone now, so I've got everything crossed uh, that, that we shouldn't experience that again. I do apologise. Yes, everything crossed. Um, so, yeah, just thinking about those sorts of um, consequences that we can then end up um, kind of feeling like our anxiety is actually ongoing. It's not getting any better. And actually our quality of life ends up going down. Um, so that anxiety and worry keeps coming. The thoughts and sensations keep coming. Um, that we can feel tired and fatigued, we can struggle with our sleep. And actually, as I said, when we're spending a lot of time engaging with those thoughts and doing all those things to try and keep ourselves safe, actually all the good things in life tend to go out of the window. So we end up kind of staying in our safe zone, that we end up not doing as much of the things that we would normally enjoy or, or want to be doing. And actually, as a consequence of that, we can also feel low and down. We can find that we're reducing confidence or it can have quite an impact on our relationships. Um, and actually, if you're anything like me, when we respond to anxiety, we might do that in some unhelpful ways. So that might be eating too much, eating the wrong things, having that one or two more glasses of wine than we intended. And actually then the opposite of you taking care of yourself and looking after your well-being um, starts to happen. Um, and as I said, we can then get in that spiral where we might be overactive or we might be underactive. So it's really important to know that these thoughts and these reactions are very normal and understandable, but it's important to, to notice those and to perhaps develop some helpful ways to respond to our thinking um, and some helpful ways to cope so we can actually improve your quality of life and actually reduce some of that anxiety. We won't be looking to eliminate that anxiety or those worries altogether. As I said earlier, it's about making space whilst enabling you to focus on what's important to you. So the things that we're going to cover um, that can be really helpful, I guess it all falls under that bracket of, of what's in your control. So often actually what happens to us in the future is not altogether within our control. But what we do and what we focus on in the here and now is within our control. So it's really important to think about finding out the facts for you and developing a bit of a shared plan with your team where you can. Um, knowing how um, and what your triggers are and being able to prepare for that. Finding ways to manage your thinking, which I'm going to talk a bit about, and that might be, as I mentioned earlier, developing more balanced, more helpful ways of thinking, or finding ways to let go of thoughts that you're getting quite stuck on. We'll touch on a little bit of those healthy lifestyle choices. It's important to do things that you enjoy and try and keep active, take some risks. We know, again, in the context of COVID, that's requiring a little bit of creative thinking and a bit of tweaking. So we'll, we'll touch on that as well. 
And actually, it's important to remind yourselves of what's helped before, what's helped in the past, because um, actually there's often uh, a little toolkit that we, uh, we can think of, of things that really get us through difficult times that we can be applying um, right now. Thinking about ways to reconnect with other people, um, whilst also keeping that balance, keeping some space for some downtime for you, some relaxation. And um, I'll briefly touch a little bit on sleep um, and ways to just be gentle, be kind with yourself and, and make a bit of space for some of those feelings. So it's very tempting and it's very hard not to, but try not to compare yourselves to other people. Um, you're unique, your situation is unique, so it's really important to kind of take your uh, experience as yours and not try and uh, contrast that with what other people might be experiencing. Um, and try and be confident that your specialist team do know their stuff. So it's knowing, knowing what's relevant to you and knowing that your team um, know you well, know what um, treatment and what advice um, is best for you. So it can be really helpful to just ask your team for information about your particular risks uh, and knowing what's um, important for you to be looking out for. Um, and some useful guidance that if you when if and when you do have concerns um, what to do about that who to contact so you feel safe and reassured that actually if you do um, have any problems have any worries that you know the right person to go to at the right time um, it can also be helpful to ask your team for some sensible advice about any changes you can make to your lifestyle or things that they would generally be advising to help you stay well um, other things again is about knowing what to expect. I know again at the moment some of that's a little bit up in the air um, but getting a sense of when your appointments might be, um, who you might see or speak to um, just so you feel a little bit clearer and again a bit more reassured of, of what to expect. And from having those sorts of conversations you can start to develop a bit of a shared plan with your healthcare team and that's also something that you can share with friends and loved ones as you feel uh, comfortable with. Um, so there's some aspects of knowing what's, what's going to come and, and knowing how best to worry, uh, manage any worries or concerns. As I mentioned earlier there's, there's triggers that, that will increase that anxiety um, we know that when we've got scans coming up, that's difficult. So again, we're not going to get rid of those anxieties or fears, but it's just about some few hints and tips to keep that in check. So thinking about having a few distractions and things to focus on in the days before. Um, it's perhaps writing a list of questions that you might have for your team if it's the follow up appointment from the scan. Um, and having a pen and paper if at the moment any of those conversations are happening by phone but equally if you're going in person that can be really helpful too uh, and just having some things with you in the waiting area if you're going in to see people um, having things that can be a bit of a distraction can be helpful and it's also useful on the day of the scans to plan something to do afterwards something that's either a bit of a space to decompress from all of that anxiety um, or just having something that's a bit lighter something to enjoy um, so it's really helpful to think about that time after the scan as well and with anniversaries it might be thinking about in advance how do i want to mark that what might i want to do and sometimes it's having a few options because you might not know until the time um, so that could be helpful to have a few ideas of things that you might um, find helpful on the day and actually at difficult times we know it can be helpful to to connect with others where we can so trying to reach out to other people and, and share our our feelings and concerns and be supported um, can be really helpful So thinking, the mind uh, is very challenging time at times. We can often find that our mind's racing, lots of thoughts um, that we often feel we don't have much control over. So some of the things that I'm going to run through might be about how to create more balanced, more helpful ways of thinking, uh, ways to kind of make peace with some of that uncertainty, um, and also some ways to let go of some of those thoughts. So notice when we're getting tangled up in them and having some ways to um, unhook, as it were, um, and to refocus on the present moment. So with 
challenging our thoughts. Um, it's useful to know what's going through your mind. So that might be if you're noticing that you're feeling more anxious or you're noticing an increase in any of uh, the feelings that we've talked about, it can be helpful to stop and check in with yourself to notice or ask yourself, what's been going through my mind just now? What, are, what have I been thinking about? What have I been focusing on that might be contributing to how I'm feeling? Sometimes people find it helpful to jot those thoughts down because that can help them then take a different perspective and can help them notice what's going on. Um, and actually there's all sorts of different questions that we can um, ask ourselves to help us get a more, pa more balanced um, and more useful way of thinking. So if we notice an anxious thought cropping up, we can ask ourselves, actually, is that thought accurate? Is that thought correct? Is there proof that definitely supports that thought? Another really useful one is actually stopping to think what you would say to a friend or a loved one who is having the same thought. Often we can be really hard on ourselves and the, the things that we can tell ourselves are, are quite difficult. And actually we often would be responding to people in a very different and more compassionate way. Um, so taking that perspective of giving some advice to a friend, having that thought can be really useful. Checking in with yourself, perhaps um, remembering some of those thinking patterns and um, noticing, am I jumping to a conclusion here? Or am I focusing on the negatives? Am I potentially taking things out of proportion? Um, and then asking yourself, um, what would be the effect of thinking about things in a bit more of a balanced way? Um, how would that be helpful for me? So I've just given a little example of what that might look like. So the initial thought might be, the cancer will come back um, and I will not be able to cope with more treatment. So a more balanced or more helpful way of thinking might be, well, the cancer may come back, but even if it does, I've already coped with treatment and I could probably do it again. So the key here is we're not expecting you to take a difficult thought and turn it into a super positive unrealistic thought because that isn't helpful. It's about gaining a realistic um, helpful perspective. Um, so getting that balance really. So acknowledging that there may be some difficulty ahead, there may be some possibility uh, that the cancer comes back, but acknowledging um, ways in which you might cope or ways in which might, that might be manageable. So I don't know if you can see this chat very well, the quote with this chat. So this is the anxiety monster. Uh, and she's invited him in for tea. Um, so often you can't get rid of fears, but you can find ways to start learning to live with them. So the more we run away from them, the often the more powerful they are. But actually, if we um, stop and allow some of that in, um, it, it feels a little bit more peaceful. So we know as in the current situation that's got a great deal of uncertainty about it, that actually it's a big part of life. There's lots of things that we don't know about the future that's outside of our control. Um, and we do day to day find ways to live with that. And actually the more we try and eliminate uncertainty, the more we try and get control over it, as we talked before, the more we get stuck in that cycle and actually life isn't uh, what, what we imagined it to be and that we can be missing out on quite a lot. So it's really key to see whether we can try and focus on what is certain and what is within your control. And that, as I mentioned earlier, is often what's in the here and now. And actually, it's also about reconnecting with that fact, as I mentioned, that we, we have lived and coped with uncertainty for our, uh, all of our lives, really. Um, and that there will be ways in which you can do that in this situation as well. This is also one of my favourites. I think that's fairly representative of my brain on a day to day basis. <laughs> so sometimes we just get overwhelmed by a, a sea of thoughts and that we can just get hooked. Sometimes we get hooked. It's a bit like going around in a washing machine and we can kind of go through the same set of thoughts over and over again. And we're going nowhere, you know, and if you're anything like me, that's the second you switch your light off and your brain says, well, now's the time for me to remind you of all those difficult things that you've not been having time to think about during the day. And I'm going to keep reminding you just in case you forget and off it goes. My brain can quite quickly get all tangled up in lots of thoughts. So some of you might be familiar with um, mindfulness or the idea of mindfulness. Um, 
it's not about having no thoughts and it's not about having no feelings it's more about helping you notice what's going on so the moment i stop like the the, the picture before the moment i stop and notice oh that's my mind doing lots of thinking that actually creates a little bit of space between you and the, that kind of sea of thoughts and it gives you that moment to feel a little bit more settled and more grounded so mindfulness is noticing that those sorts of thoughts are showing up and it's just about doing that noticing without any particular judgment so having those thoughts is neither good nor bad it's just what's going on right now um, um, as I mentioned, when we start to do that, when we start to notice um, our thinking, then actually it frees us up a little bit to engage more in the present moment on what we want to be doing and what we want to be focusing on. And there's different ways that you can practice mindfulness. It is a bit like a skill, so it's not something you get straight away. Um, so you can do that through particular meditations or there's ways of doing activities mindfully. And again, I can share and I will share some resources and um, some useful places to start if that's something that you would like to explore. Again, it's about making some sensible decisions on what is within your control, what's in your remit right now. Some of that might be around lifestyle choices. So you can think about having a healthy, balanced diet, finding out some information um, from various charities or from your team, finding ways to keep active. Um, and I've got a little star there because we'll think about that in the context of actually our lives being a little bit more restricted at the moment, but thinking about creatively what things you might enjoy or what things work for you. And just sort of moderating other things such as smoking or alcohol um, and asking for, for help and advice if there's anything that you're not sure of or, or want some more information about how you can stay healthy and, and active. Um, and there's lots out there and we can do some signposting as well. Um, so thinking about doing things that you enjoy. So you can still process some of these difficult feelings, but also have some things that you can look forward to or things that give you some enjoyment or pleasure. And, you know, it's really important that your illness doesn't have to be all that you are. It's been a part of your experience and it may well be a part of your experience going forward, but it's not you in your entirety. Um, so it's really thinking about what or who is important to you and I know um, that has been even more so important um, in the current context of keeping those connections, um, hopefully with a better Wi-Fi connection um, than at St George's. Um, starting to think about some of the things that you might like to get back to um, and it might be that some of those things are possible now and certainly I'm thinking about things that I want to get back to in the future um, and, and having those plans and ideas but it might be about thinking about things that you might be doing day to day that are possible at the moment things that you weren't ordinarily making time for or with all the treatment going on you didn't have the time or you didn't have the energy um thinking if there are things that you might like to try some new things um and again there's some creative things that you can try online uh, or taking time to to do new things um and actually also just thinking about what and who makes you laugh um and another one of my favorite pictures so if anybody finds a creative way to do air balloon gardening um i would love you to get in touch um because that looks like great fun so thinking about keeping active, we know that is more challenging at the moment. I think a lot of you will be at home uh, and shielding. Um, so it's being a bit creative and making some adjustments and doing things a bit differently. Um, I've put a few links in here that I know the Overcome team um, will be able to share with you. Um, so these were just a few that I picked out, but again, I can think about some other suggestions if that would be helpful. Um, so the Royal Marsden have gotten a few nice ideas um, and there was a particular uh, element that had a few different videos that are thinking about exercise. Um, and NHS One U again has some really nice um, videos of some exercise that you can do from home, um, encourages you and see, kind of join in with other people. 
Um, and I've also put um, our, at St George's, we have um, a Macmillan Centre, but they've um, created their own YouTube channel, um, which is very advanced and very techy, very outside my remit. <laughs> but they uh, have put lots of videos on there and there's a whole mix actually. So there's some exercise advice and ideas from Macmillan specialists, um, but there's also some complementary therapies. So you can either kind of watch those back or there's a, a schedule on there and you can see things that you can join um, live but I know lots of charities that, that are doing that and providing those sorts of things um, so it might be about getting a bit creative. It's also important to still think about pacing yourself you know um, going through treatment is significant we know that will have an impact um, on your fitness on your energy levels so it's trying to spread out your activity during the day trying not to go full charge in the morning and then be a heap in the afternoon, trying to have a bit of structure to your day, trying to spread out those activities. And actually as part of that can be really helpful to set some sort of small realistic targets as well, having things that you can work towards and build up to. Um, there's also a really nice website um, called Coping with Coronavirus um, and that's got a few nice ideas about how we can still be setting goals, still be working towards things that are important and meaningful to us even though our lives are a little bit more restricted at the moment. So there's lots of resources on there but there's a particular one called Setting Values Based Goals Whilst in Isolation so that's worth a little look at to give you a few hints and ideas of, of ways to move forward. Um, and definitely I think now more than ever is that importance of keeping a bit of a routine um, so when life feels a bit uncertain or we feel more anxious or out of control actually having a bit of routine having a bit of structure um, helps us overcome some of those fears some of that anxieties it makes day-to-day -day feel a little bit more predictable a little bit more um, certain um, I left this in. I know at the moment we might not be in a position to be taking small risks, um, but actually I think it is important to hold this in mind that going back to doing anything um, that we might have been doing or, or moving towards something new at the end of treatment can feel really scary. Um, and sometimes we don't feel that um, kind of relaxed sense of confidence that actually we sometimes have to bundle up that anxiety, take it with us and take a little bit of a leap. And actually that might just be things like reconnecting with people um, that you hadn't spoken to for a little while um, or having some of those conversations with people at the end of treatment and navigating what that feels like. So sometimes it's about uh, taking the plunge and having a go and, and knowing that that won't feel totally comfortable, um, but it would be important to, to help you gradually move forward. I think it can be really helpful to remind yourself of things that have helped you before, helped you through difficult times, helped you when you felt anxious, when you felt low, when you have felt that loss of confidence. So we know that, that this won't be the only tricky experience that you've had in your lives. So checking in with yourself, actually, what, what have I found useful when I've been feeling uncomfortable, when I've been feeling nervous? and almost kind of creating a little bit of a first aid toolkit for you. Um, and these are often things that we find kind of soothing, relaxing or comforting. Um, and that can be physical, so there can be bits and pieces that you can go to, um, or that might just be things, uh, ideas, little notes to self, or things that you can remind yourself of, people that you can speak to, or particular things that just make you uh, feel more relaxed, like films or books or anything that suits you. So really taking that time to notice actually when I struggled before this has been really helpful and, and this is something that I can maybe try and, and use again. So again reconnecting with others we're using lots of creative ways with technology at the moment and actually I think I've spoken to people more than I would have done um, if I were out and about so ensuring there are still ways that you do spend time with with loved ones resist that sort of urge to, to isolate yourself. Um, there's various options that can be with friends and family um, there are some options through charities where you might be able to talk to other people who've been in similar situations there might be um, these sorts of um, ah, thank you very much these sorts of um, sessions that go on with groups of folks or there might be online resources and things that you can chat to people and I know that's certainly something that um, Overcome do. So try to find creative ways um, through those charities, through technologies to, to keep connected. 
as I mentioned earlier, having some time for you in that balance. So we want you to be doing a little bit more, but we also want you to be taking care of yourself at the same time. So there's all sorts of different ways of relaxing. Um, I've put a few links here to um, some complementary therapies. So I've put on Macmillan uh, YouTube video. Um, I've put the Royal Marsden again, actually, because they did a really nice video on how to give yourself a hand massage, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And is something I would never have thought of. Um, so again, it's getting creative and, and having that time to pamper you. Um, and actually when we're having less physical contact with people, those sorts of things where we're snuggling, we're comforting ourselves, and those can be really, really beneficial. Um, thinking a little bit about sleep, these are some hints and tips to, to help you try and get some, some better rest. Um, getting that balance between activity and rest, trying to get that structure to your day. Um, we recommend trying where you can to have the same getting up and going to bed time, trying to have an unwind period before you're going to bed. So avoiding doing anything particularly taxing or stressful, um, just having that time before bed to sort of settle and, and relax. Uh, and part of that can be keeping your bedroom for things that are just relaxing. So trying not to mix up doing other stressful activities or um, difficult admin tasks in your bedroom, trying to keep that to, to relaxing things. Um, we've mentioned trying to avoid naps we know that you will feel tired during the day so um, you may need to nap and that's fine but we recommend keeping that to 20 to 30 minutes and, and usually the afternoon is a good time and that might give you a little bit of a boost if you find that your your mind's busy it might be about using some of those thought um, strategies or using some mindfulness and again, I put a nice link here to the um, Centre for Clinical Interventions. It's got some nice handouts on tips for, for sleep. This one is really important. We're not very good at it, but finding ways to be kind to yourself. This is a difficult time. You know, if you had someone you love going through this transition from treatment, um, you would say this is difficult and take your time and be gentle with yourself. Don't be hard, don't be self-critical. And going back to that, what would you say um, that would be kind and loving to someone going through that same um, situation? And again, those sort of physical comforts and things that help soothe us are all the more important at the moment. And again, a couple of links to um, some organisations that might be helpful. And making room for emotions. So as I've mentioned several times, these feelings are gonna show up, but it's about noticing them, not trying to get rid of them, not trying to push them down, allowing them to come, allowing them to pass. Um, and if you find actually, no matter what you're trying, that keeps coming up and you're getting stuck, then it is okay to, to say that you're struggling and get a little bit more help. Um, so I've got a brief video. I know I'm running out of time, so we'll scoot through this. Um, but this sort of just shows that example of allowing yourself to have some feelings. So this was taken from Inside Out. Um, which is a Disney Pixar film um, and the character you can see on the left is Sadness um, and you'll see another character called Happiness um, and they're trying to provide some comfort for Bing Bong here so I'm going to get let you have a little uh, watch and see what you think. Riley had great adventures. Oh, 
They were wonderful. Once we flew back in time, we had breakfast twice that day. Sadness! It sounds amazing. I bet Riley liked it. Oh, she did. We were best friends. <laughs> yeah, it's sad. <laughs> I'm okay now. Come on. The train station is this way. So I think it just il illustrates the point that we don't always need to rush to fix our feelings. Sometimes it's just acknowledging those feelings, making a bit of space, being gentle and kind with ourselves. And actually that can often go um, a long way. But, you know, it is okay to not feel okay, but there is support there for you. If some of these strategies you're finding don't quite help you and, and you're getting quite stuck, then it's important to tell someone, talk to your healthcare team, that might be your um, oncology team, that might be your GP, um, and get, you might also want to get some help and support from a loved one. Um, there is support available, so there's services like um, mine, um, based at some of the, the larger cancer centres. Um, that you can access through your team. There's also um, support and talking therapies through both um, your primary care, so that'd be through your GP, um, and then maybe through some community palliative care teams if, if you're known to them, um, and other supports through um, various charities. Um, so Overcome has some information about um, managing some of those anxieties and information through Macmillan. Depending where you are, there may be certain things that you can access through local charities or cancer centres. Um, Maggie's is a, a nationwide one, and they've often got some really helpful um, things on offer, including talking therapies. Um, so it's worth finding out what might be available to you. Um, I won't spend ages on this. I'll, I'll let the ladies perhaps collate that for you. Um, but these are some um, apps that are free to you that are a mixture of um, relaxation, some mindfulness and some ways to help us cope with some of those thoughts and some of those worries. Um, and I've also popped um, the Untire app that will be familiar to the Overcome team as well. Um, that's a way of helping you manage some of the uh, tiredness and fatigue that you might experience and, and ways to help you balance um, activity and rest and start to get back into things and um, so we'll make sure you've got all of that available all right so i think i've got through most things sorry for the the drop off in the middle and running a little bit over time but um yeah